evening to all speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audience in different parts of the world, and welcome to the uh, ACNS uh, webinar. It's my honor for me to introduce uh, today's webinar. Mm -hmm. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from Japan, Professor Yoshihiro Muragaki. Yeah. Professor uh, Muragaki is the professor of neurosurgery at the Center for Advanced Medical Engineering Research and Development of Kobe University, Japan. Earlier, he was the director of the Medical AI Center of Tokyo Women's Medical University. He is a pioneer in glioma surgery in Japan and the needs and is the center with the largest number of surgery for gliomas in this country. He has received several awards and honors, including the Japan Open Innovation Prize. He is also a doctor researcher with over 300 publications and over 3,000 citations. We're extremely honored to have him today at our webinar. And today he will be talking about the smart cyber operation theater for guided resection of gliomas. The speaker of the second session of today is our distinguished guest from China, Dr. Yahu Xiao. Dr. Xiao is an attending neurosurgeon in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Beijing Tintan Hospital in China. She's an expert in the management of cerebral vascular diseases. We're extremely honored to have her today at our webinar, and today she'll be talking about the surgical choices for more and more disease. The chair for the first section of today is the distinguished faculty from Russia, uh, in Belgium, Professor Christian Rothopoulos. Professor Rothopoulos is a professor and the head of the Department of Neurosurgery at the St. Luke University Hospital in Brussels, in Belgium. It's a near future uh, about to join the most modern hospital in Russia, the Delta Hospital of Surak. Professor Rothschild's scientific contributions include the development of a new classification of intracranial uh, pressure waveforms and development of uh, modified surgical techniques for chiari malformation, meningo cells, and intracranial aneurysms. His considerable work is reflected in more than 100 articles of which he's the author or co-author that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. He is also a past general secretary of the, and the president of the French Language uh, Neurosurgery Society, uh, N uh, SNCLF. We're extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the first session of today's webinars. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our only guest from China, Professor Xu Bin. Professor Xu Bin, without further introduction, is the consultant neurosurgeon at the Huashan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. He's also the vice president of the ACNS. He's a well renowned cerebral vascular expert and leads the world's largest series of the bypass surgery for more, more disease. We're extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the section. On behalf of the educational committee of the ACNS and the president, and Professor Yo Kato, I would like to welcome both speakers and chairs and the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we're extremely thankful to Professor Xu Bin for broadcasting the webinar on WeChat channel. And today we, we will also have uh, Dr. Liu Singh from Malaysia, uh, who, who is the co-host of today. With that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Christian of the Poros. Professor of the Poros, please. Thank you. Is it possible to share a few slides? Yes, definitely. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Mura Gaki, and <laughs> especially for this topic about state of art operating room. I must say that uh, I was uh, I read with a lot of pleasure one of his papers, this one, Robotic Technology in Operating Rooms, a review, in which, once again, he introduced the concept of smart cyber operating theater. And I, I, I am really happy to introduce him because I share a lot of his uh, ideas and concepts. I must say that uh, in my department, I started in 1996 with the robotic navigated microscope of MKM of Zeitz. And then we went for the Pentero Kinevo microscope of Zeitz and then to Brain Lab. And in 2006, we developed the concept of a twin neurosurgical MR suite with a three magnet MRI. 
and mm -hmm. with a robotic table moving the patient from the main OR to the MR OR. Mm -hmm. You see that in 2007, we went to, to buy the dextroscope, which is a preoperative virtual surgery uh, tool, patient specific again. You see that in 2009, we bought another robot, the Zigo one from Siemens, which helped us to perform intraoperative quality control during surgery. 2013, we bought the second uh, 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 Zigo machine from Siemens. Mm -hmm. And now, this year, we have the opportunity to acquire the Stell Autoguide a robot from Medtronic to implement uh, intra electrode for, for epilepsy uh, workout. And now we are dealing with a, a company to buy this wonderful robotic arm, which has been validated for spine and for head surgery. But what is important is to use, as Professor Maragaki, Muragaki has said, we have to perform information guide surgery and all these robots must use the different uh, investigations that we can perform, like uh, here a PET scan, DTI MRI to analyze the different pathway that we have to avoid during resection surgery and also intraoperative electrophysiology. But there is a big problem and this problem is the escalation of the medical care cost. But now I would like to come back to this paper of Professor Muragaki. And I was impressed when I read this paper for the first time that on the first line, uh, my colleague sp spoke about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting is the artificial intelligence knowledge became in the mainstream only at the beginning of this year with the open AI and Professor Muragaki with his team has stressed that his Scott concept had four main goals and one of these main goals was to use the assistance of AI. And I would like to congratulate you because you are one, you are one of the few to introduce the AI concept in the neurosurgical uh, room. And I'm really happy and uh, eager to listen to your lecture. I give you the floor. Thank you, Professor Left Plus. So you have already talked about the essence of my lecture. Thank you very much. And uh, this work was done in the uh, Tokyo Women's Medical University and I was uh, just moved from TWMU to the Kobe University last September. So I will start the lecture. At first, I would like to introduce our moonshot patient-guided therapy that provides safe and reproducible treatment. The most important part of uh, Surgeon New Eye is providing solid intraoperative visible data like a IMRI and a strategy desk that is a surgeon new brain analyze a different kind of information and advice to the operator that is like a pilot and control tower. At this point the manipulation itself is done by surgeon's hand. Uh, we are developing such a new hand like a uh, such a laser and the focused ultrasound and the robot. The SCART is a space where we could finally realize the pressure guided therapy. So different from a standard operation room that is a space for surgery, the SCART is the very existence of one medical device for diagnostics. So all devices are packaged network to be uh, an industrial middleware to integrate all data and uh, robotically controlled for performing the pressure guided therapy so i will show the video so in the future we will have uh, three types of surgery one is uh, for solid organ like uh, a breast tumor surgery and vascular surgery and the luminal surgery and the core of the device is uh, mri and also and uh, endoscope. 
So after packaging uh, these kind of devices, uh, uh, we could uh, network uh, uh, by using middleware. If that's the case, uh, all data was time synchronized and uh, uh, tagged with the data of the location by navigation. If that's the case, uh, all data are tagged by time and place. So using this kind of high quality of data, uh, we could uh, do precise decision making during surgery. And the future maybe robotical the uh, control the uh, medical device like focus of the sound uh, uh, could be controlled by this kind of data. So getting uh, all kinds of the, these uh, high quality data in the future AI will advise to uh, us uh, at the final part of the surgery like at uh, um, and the end of the surgical this rejection AI advice to, to us uh, they could show the three types of the option and uh, in this case we could uh, plan B and that means a five percent of uh, increase of the uh, risk of the complication however uh, yes. one year high uh, survival yes. prolongation this case is practically finished I will be in your Scott in a minute let's start another surgery get ready The purpose of the Scott project is to improve the safety and effectiveness of treatment by development of an integrated operating room, uh, Scott. To do that, uh, we need four steps. First step is uh, packaging basic devices that we call the basic Scott. Second step is networking operating room, that is IoT, so that is standard Scott and also robotizing therapeutic medical device and uh, developing AI to support decision making, that is a hyperscot. So this is a roadmap of the Scott project. First step, packaging is done by uh, basic Scott in Hiroshima University in 2016. And the second Scott uh, is a standard Scott uh, where all devices are networked by Uplink uh, installed in 2018 in Shinshu University and the third and fourth step of HyperScot prototype uh, was installed in 2016 and the clinical version in 2019 uh, at our uh, university. So before this uh, project uh, we have experience of the uh, IMI and uh, MI competitive devices in 2000. Uh, uh, we call the classic Scott. This is our classic Scott packaged with IMI and uh, I'm a competitive devices. We have uh, experienced more than 2,000 cases, is, uh, including 400 uh, uh, cases since 2000. 0.4 Tesla MRI, and uh, this shows uh, clearly reduced the tumor of uh, first rejection and uh, achieved. Uh, uh, enough uh, rejection and uh, causing uh, mean rejection rate uh, was 90% and uh, uh, five year over survival of grade two and three and four uh, were 92%, 77% and 90% respectively. And also uh, IMI showed uh, uh, detection of uh, uh, expected event uh, like uh, intratumor breathing uh, control rachel, uh, subdural hematoma, and uh, uh, remaining metal pieces from a uh, uh, broken Jewish bar, uh, causing a very, very low rate of mortality, uh, which was 0.05% uh, uh, compared to the 3% of the standard OR. So in, we could show that the improvement of safety and effectiveness uh, by classical so I will show the video of the uh, operation in classic start. So this is a patient of uh, insular glioma close to the speech area. So this is uh, we also developed the uh, receiving coil laser fixation. This is special operator. So after craniotomy, we uh, are doing a fast MRI to check the difference between preoperative and intraoperative and also uh, the image for the navigation. So this is also transparent uh, drape 
and uh, we will make uh, uh, the patient awake. So this is also uh, special apparatus uh, for the awake surgery. It shows uh, some uh, task and uh, checking the voltage of the generator uh, and the video, patient condition. So we found the speech area so, uh, in purple color. The classical broker area was the uh, speech area. Also doing a uh, MEP and uh, intraoperative discology by frozen section. And also we are doing uh, some special method uh, intraoperative flow cytometry. So we could get the result in 10 minutes. We check the uh, percentage of the mitotic cell per all cell. So it's very easy. Just deep in the special liquid checking get the result the percentage of mitotic cells were 6% it is very high because the normal brain is around 5% so it is very malignant we should remove as much as possible so after 4 hours almost taking out of the tumor by uh, navigation. However, we should check uh, residual tumor by IMRI, second MRI. So we found a very, very small remnant here. So we did the second rejection. So this is a uh, uh, illustrative case uh, by information guided surgery across to the language area. As you can see, basal ganglia and also insula and uh, very close to the uh, Wernicke area and Broca area. So in Scott, the first oral is a basic Scott installed in at the Hiroshima University. So uh, not only glioma case uh, but also epilepsy surgery uh, were used in basic scot. Also, uh, orthopedic uh, surgeon used uh, use this uh, system and the same story. Uh, they saw the uh, total removal. However, there are some residual tumor here and uh, second rejection uh, accomplished uh, complete removal. So this is a very good example to use uh, I am alive in the surgery. So in this OR, uh, we are performing uh, information guided surgery uh, to get the higher rejection rate and uh, uh, lower complication rate. So using anatomical information like this one, I am alive navigation, and uh, to preserve the function, we need uh, some kind of awake surgery or uh, function mapping. Uh, we call the function information. Also, uh, we should uh, uh, discriminate uh, uh, tumor from normal tissue. So, uh, using uh, uh, intraoperative histology or rapid flow cytometer and so on. So, uh, we succeed to uh, make uh, uh, this kind of data to digital. However. So this is actual case of visualization and DX of biomedical signal. Uh, this patient is 32 old man with epilepsy uh, having a lesion of the dominant hemisphere hippocampus. So we did the surgery in a classical scot and uh, take a sample uh, from the center of the lesion and uh, histology and the pathology is saying that uh, the sample itself is not normal. However, it's not the tumor. So please take another sample. However, we confirm that the center of the tumor, if that's the case, uh, we stop the rejection, only biopsy. At that time, we have a, a machine of the rapid uh, uh, flow cytometry. It's showing the peak in the dividing cell, this MF phase. So uh, we decided to remove the tumor. So this is visualization. Compared to the normal pattern, it's uh, obvious. It's the uh, same as tumor. Then, next step is the digitize, because uh, only peak 
uh, doesn't do too, say too much. So we uh, made some kind of the malignancy index that is uh, cell count dividing um, power over cell count. If that's the case, so this sample is a 40 percent uh, compared to the normal 4 percent. So it's a digitization. However, it's very difficult to, to uh, make a decision uh, if the case, uh, uh, this number is 10% uh, or 5% and so on. So we analyze uh, 328 cases. It's showing that uh, uh, the threshold is 7% uh, uh, discriminating tumor from uh, normal tissue by ROC analysis. So it came uh, information because it's easy to uh, make a decision, 10% or 5% and other stuff. So uh, this is uh, informationization. So we published the JNS of this study. So MY showed the significant associations with uh, WHO historical grades of glioma like this one. Uh, so no network among devices as so all stand alone. So after connecting uh, all devices that are providing uh, all kind of information, finally, we, uh, all data is time synchronized and also uh, integrated by location using uh, navigation data. So networking all devices, this is uh, Internet of Things, IoT. So I will also show the promotion video of the SCAR. This is uh, one example of the software of a strategy desk. Uh, you could see so all data is connected uh, by location, like this is MEP data here, and also for cytometry data here. This is a standard squad where 20 medical devices connected to be uh, middleware. I was in Shinsh University Hospital at the time of the first case in the world. It's amazing because uh, all synchronized real-time uh, data well, uh, in the strategy desk. Uh, uh, I'm advising to the surgeon uh, the data of the full cytometry, uh, which uh, a surgeon has not known yet. So this is a part of the uh, re recurrent part. However, this T2 high area is not tumor. So this is real-time advice through strategy desk to surgeons. So this is the other case of Shinsh University, 30-year-old boy with a suicide trauma. So Dr. Goto is uh, drilling out uh, around the condo uh, using uh, CT navigation. We also uh, monitoring uh, ABL and this is digital data so we could change the range and the timing uh, itself. 
and also Dr. Goto is a little bit wondering uh, uh, of the place of the ring because a young boy a different anatomy so Professor Hongo uh, from the office is advising to him using a telementoring system so this uh, blue line and uh, where Dr. Goto should drill this is very useful so interaction lesion so uh, we are doing biopsy so we could get the uh, result of a rapid flow cytometry uh, around 10 minutes it's showing that kind of the stuff the, uh, the dividing cell is around 31 percent that is a definitely tumor so it's also tagged in the navigation system of MR navigation we change from CT to MR navigation so during the resection, MEP uh, gradually decreases. So we are checking the MEP data uh, like this one, left side here. We also could see the uh, monitoring data of the uh, blood pressure or saturation or other stuff. So uh, after first resection, we are checking uh, IMRI showing the, some residual tumor is uh, of the anterior side, so we did uh, a second resection. So we could get uh, more than 90% rejection uh, of these cases. In standard Scott, uh, we're doing also transosphenoidal treatment surgery like this one including acoustic tumor uh, uh, so far 40 cases uh, have been operated in standard scar the record of the strategic desk is a very good uh, educational tool because of uh, uh, many kinds of information contained uh, like uh, navigation data and uh, microscope data and the flow cytometry and the multi-hypoxic potential data together and also uh, it includes a, a comment of the surgeon as uh, a point itself so this is uh, we just uh, uh, up the website to see many people to for especially uh, young new surgeon so BBC News reported our hyperscot and our air system in 2019. As more of the world's population gravitates towards urban centers, how do leaders, planners and architects stay ahead and make them better places to live and work? Now on BBC World News, Mariko Oi looks at one of Asia's most vibrant, exploring innovations in robotics, transportation, farming, housing and leisure. Leading cities, Tokyo. In Tokyo, you can already see the impact of this technology everywhere, from restaurants to hotels to hospitals. This is what staff at Tokyo Women's Medical University believe is the future of surgery. あの、これは受診The Smart Cyber Operating Theater, or SCOT, connects medical devices together and consolidates the information in real time, helping surgeons make critical decisions. I understand that artificial intelligence is also involved. How does that help the surgeon? あの、こちらにですね、すごく重要な情報があのナビゲーションと一緒に統合されています。で、この状況が溜まっていくとですね、最終的には AI が手術の最後の時、受診者が迷った時に、え、ここを取ると何%ぐらい患者さんの生命予防が伸びるか、等々をあの示してくれる。AI を目指して現在、え、開発しています。this theater is already being used for brain surgery, and the team here believe the technology can be utilized in the future for other types of operations. Up to air study, uh, we try to predict the three group of the lower grade gluon and molecular subjects operatively. Image and the numeric data from multimodality and medical image. 
in reserved, uh, we have uh, achieved uh, uh, 68 percent of the overall allocation that was uh, doubled the expected value for three group classification problem uh, at the time of the allocation uh, of the publication. This is clinical version of hyperscot, uh, always 0.4 tesla MRI, organic air like here, Lovely thick operating table and 4K exoscope. This is a case of awake uh, uh, surgery close to the speech fiber. Uh, we integrated the methanine pad. Uh, we removed the model of 95% uh, uh, of the tube. A case of uh, professional surgical decision making by predicting prognosis uh, using uh, intraoperative fluorocytometry. This is a young patient to glioma in sensory cortex, very close to the motor area. Uh, the point is whether or not we should remove the very high area in motor cortex. In conclusion, we preserve this area, although intraoperative histology showed some malignant cell. But intraoperative fluorocytometry showed very, very low mitotic index, only 2%, uh, with a high cell count. Finally, final diagnosis showed uh, oligodendroglioma that is very uh, chemosensitive, so we shouldn't uh, remove this area. So our surgical decision making uh, is correct. This is the area whether or not. Uh, we should remove and uh, subcortical mapping showed uh, uh, motor reaction here. This is a case of thymic GBM uh, high polyethyl approach, and uh, we are doing a subcortical mapping to preserve uh, motor function. And uh, at this point, MP no change, fine. However, six minutes later, suddenly decrease of the MP. So we could look back uh, during surgery of this uh, uh, strategy desk and uh, we could find the cause of the glaze of the MEP like this one touching very close to the motor uh, fiber. So we try not to touch uh, around here and uh, we could remove more than 95% removal uh, with a very mild paralysis. So these two cases uh, showed uh, a very usefulness of uh, strategy desk and in the future uh, collecting the old data and uh, AI will predict uh, a complication rate and uh, a prognosis. So we combined HyperScot system with AI simulation software grid. Uh, this is my centric GBM uh, motor fiber is here. Um, very difficult to uh, make a decision uh, from a supine or plong and the approach is this from this side and this side. And the grid showed uh, a fantastically tumor and uh, uh, motor and the sensory fiber here. So we decided the plum position. During surgery, uh, this uh, 3D uh, image uh, integrated with navigation and uh, successfully we removed uh, uh, both tumors and uh, very, uh, with very mild hemiparesis. So two giants, Dr. McLeod, he is a surgeon, and also Dr. Pitt, a mathematician, developed AI. So AI innovated by surgeon would finally support the surgery at SCOT. In the future, the SCOT will go out from the hospital and work in the disaster street or the populated area. What strategy desk uh, uh, in the smartphone could be used for the emergency case that I am apart from uh, hospital uh, for vision trip and the Congress. So this is a case as a young uh, patient with a large mass. And uh, at that time, I was in Hawaii in the Congress. I uh, connected by iPhone and PC on Zoom. And uh, I've taken a look at uh, this case and uh, I found a very different case, uh, pattern of the flow cytometry from glioma. 
So I called them to check the pathologist again because it's not like a glioma, but a malignant lymphoma. So finally, a pathologist said it, it would be a malignant lymphoma. So we just uh, remain the very eloquent area close to the motor fiber and uh, Wernicke area. So uh, this uh, strategy desk from abroad uh, enable me to give important, important advice uh, about the histology, influence surgical strategy. So this is three types of the clinical version of the Scott. Basic Scott has already done more than 60 cases, and the standard Scott more than 40 cases, hyper Scott uh, more than 100 cases. So getting together more than 200 cases is uh, and done by Scott Overling Theater. So Nature Future, our uh, Hyper Scott prototype here. The Scott project was supported by AML. This is Japan Agency for Medical Research Development, and uh, we have five universities and urban companies and uh, collaborated together uh, by uh, more than 100 members. So uh, network is uh, done by Densho and uh, integration the sales and Hitachi and the two OR company and uh, evaluated by three university and many uh, medical device companies. I would like to briefly touch on another project uh, about uh, smart robot IREC. IREC is a smart robot for uh, a lifetime. So this is the first machine of ILEC is doing the uh, ultrasound diagnosis. Maybe this is world first diagnosis by human human and robot. So this is program-based action, but the reality of robotics is uh, uh, picking up a cup in usual environment requires uh, the level of the Nobel Prize. So the resolution of a Nobel AI called Deep Predictive Learning, and our team is working uh, on this item uh, hardly. So this is our moonshot uh, in 2050. Eric is working in the mobile squad everywhere. In conclusion, Scott is a single medical treatment device for information guided uh, uh, surgery for glioma rejection. In the future, mobile squad and uh, strategy desk will realize highly leveled medical care. Thank you for attention. Yeah. 今の最先端の機械の中で本当に必要なものは何か。このスコットは手術室の機械がですね、お互い連携し合って治療という一つの目的という機能を果たすと。各情報を可視化する誰でも非常に高いレベルで治療を行える治療士産業というものをやっていきたいと思います自動車に次ぐできれば輸出産業として So thank you for attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Muragaki, for this very stimulating presentation. And uh, as uh, every stimulating presentation, there are 
stimulate also questions. I would like to ask you my first question is that yeah. one. You know that performing a wake surgery yeah. is a, a big burden for the patient and for the, the, the physicians in the OR. Mm -hmm. don't, don't you think that with all this information, MRI, uh, PET scan, uh, preoperative MRI, virtual surgery, that in the future, we will try to reduce the stress in the OR and we will try to reduce the number of cases of awake surgery because we have enough information to perform secure surgery. What do you think? I think uh, uh, some kind of aspect you are right. And uh, maybe why we are doing awake surgery about one fourth of the old case then I think uh, uh, much more less than before because uh, we have a very good tool, MRI and uh, MEP or some uh, uh, fiber truck and the functional MRI. So including that kind of stuff, uh, 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 less number of the awake surgery. And uh, maybe in the future, uh, if uh, uh, neuroscience uh, uh, has been uh, developed, Maybe we could predict the uh, complication uh, where we are taking out. We have, could predict. So maybe all uh, general uh, anesthesia surgery uh, will be uh, will replace to the awake surgery. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. My second question is regarding your impressive intraoperative fluocytometry. Yeah. You agree with me that now, with the quality of the MRI, a good mm -hmm. a, a neuroradiologist, mm -hmm. most of the time, mm -hmm. can tell us before surgery nearly the histological type of the tumor before surgery because MRI is so performant. Do you think that uh, we should invest so much money to have in the operative room during surgery this very innovative technique as fluocytometry. Yeah, I think uh, as I showed you, uh, even AI could only predict the molecular subtype uh, 67% using a very high uh, quality of the AI. So that means uh, uh, we should do something intraoperatively. So histology by frozen section is the best way. However, it takes time, more than 30 minutes, and also pathologists uh, will have uh, uh, their risk management. Because, uh, okay. yeah, if uh, pathologists say it's a tumor, so surgeon just taking out, even uh, it's a very, very difficult to say complete tumor or uh, surrounding tissue. So that's why they are uh, saying it's not uh, uh, normal. However, it's not a definite tumor, something like that. So it's very difficult to do this you're making. <coughs> and uh, however, flow cytometry is a digital. So we, uh, uh taking uh, um, uh, uh, we are just refer that kind of the number so it's very clear decision making so but in the future maybe uh, more sophisticated technology which uh, uh, saying uh, whether or not uh, a tumor or a molecular subject because uh, some institute uh, doing a PCL during surgery so they are checking the IDH and one pinnate Q loss and uh, during surgery. But it's still, it takes time and uh, maybe an hour or something like that. So we cannot wait uh, uh, right now. Okay. But anyway, fine technology will come up. Wonderful, wonderful. I have a third and fourth question together. Mm -hmm. When we see all these technologies, new technologies, we see the robots, we see the networking, we see mm -hmm. the computers, mm -hmm. we see the fluocytometry, mm -hmm. we see the intraoperative MRI. Mm -hmm. That means that now in a new, modern, neurosurgical 
uh, or uh, you need to have engineers, technical uh, technical technicians, how, how many technicians, how many informaticians do you have in such or are now, and at what price, at what price? I think the uh, same as a standard operation because a uh, neurosurgeon taking MRI and cytometry just a dip and uh, uh, junior colleagues are doing that kind of stuff. So no additional stuff right now. And in the future, maybe the uh, technician uh, for the monitoring will uh, no need because of the just uh, networking and uh, put to the bottom for the stimulation, something like that. So we will uh, reduce the member of the operating staff for free. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. You are very welcome. Thank you, Professor Moragaki. Very yeah. impressive uh, presentation. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. If, may I ask Professor Moragaki one yeah. question? Yeah. Well, the, first of all, let me congratulate you for this very wonderful innovation that you have brought into medical science. And we are extremely grateful that you came here and accepted our invitation to show us. Uh, one question I would like to ask is about uh, uh, Raman spectroscopy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Biomass. So how, how do you think would that uh, incorporated into your... Uh, uh scott whether it can replace the uh, cytometry in any future yeah i think uh, very very uh, raman spectroscopy is uh in a sense better for morphology compared to the flow cytometry so and very quick and i heard that uh, also it takes only 10 minutes so that is uh, uh in a sense better for standard uh, intraorbital histology because uh, less time however flow cytometry is seeing uh, different stuff then we could uh, discriminate uh, oligodendroglioma from astrocytoma and also as i can show you that uh, malignant lymphoma better so flow cytometry see is seeing a different aspect of the uh, cell uh, character. So hopefully we could get both one. That is perfect. Because we try to uh, uh, buy the Lama, however, we couldn't get the grant <laughs> anyway. So okay. one more question that do yeah. you use phi dash ALA in resections of glioma yeah. in your center? Yeah, we, uh, I think in 10 years ago, we are doing, uh, five LA many times, oh, most of the time. However, as I uh, said to you that, uh, uh, more experience uh, that, uh, we don't need, uh, five LA because we have MRI and also, uh, I think, uh, GBM is a little bit easier than the low grade glioma because, uh, a little bit, uh, we could, uh, see the, some kind of the borderline. So, uh recently uh maybe one fifth of the case uh we are using five la thank you thank you very much yeah yes may i uh ask if there's any further uh, question from the floor if no then may i pass the time to our second chair professor shibin to introduce our uh second session thank you very okay much. thank you professor moragaki again and uh, now let's uh introduce uh, the second speaker uh, from Beijing Tiantan Hospital. Tiantan Hospital is the biggest uh, neurosurgical de uh, department in China. And uh, Professor uh, Zhao Yahui, uh, she works in Tiantan Hospital. And now his topic is uh, uh, the introduction, the surgical choice for Moyama disease. We all know that uh, Moyamoya uh, Moya disease is the uh, most complicated uh, uh, vas uh, vascular disease in neurosurgery. Dr. Zhao Yahui, please. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Xu for the introduction and for inviting me to be a speaker at the at this, uh, ACNS webinar. 
Uh, I work at Beijing Tiantan Hospital. It is one of the largest neurosurgery centers in China. And today I'd like to uh, talk about some surgical choices uh, for Moya Moya disease. I'll be sharing uh, our experience we gained through these years uh, at our center. Uh, it is widely known that Moya Moya disease uh, is highly prevalent in Japan, Korea, and China. Uh, it has a hereditary inclination. Uh, family, fam familial cases accounts for around 15% of all cases. And sporadic cases of MMD can also be found worldwide, affecting individuals of any race. Uh, Moya Moya disease is characterized by the progressive narrowing of the major brain uh, of the major brain arteries, uh, especially uh, those arteries uh, at the so-called fetus, usually affecting internal cerebral artery and sometimes posterior cerebral artery too. Uh, as the major brain artery gradually stenosis, fragile vessels looking like a puff of smoke uh, started to generate at the base of the brain. Uh, it is the main feature of this disease. The occlusion of ICA and PCA results in a greatly compromised cerebral blood flow uh, in the brain cortex and eventually leads to recurrent ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. Moya Moya disease is now one of the main reasons for early onset strokes in East Asia. The progression of the disease goes through six phases known as Suzuki stages from stage one to stage six the ICA gradually went from stenosis to complete occlusion. Moya Moya vessels started to generate, start to generate from stage two and intensified during stage three to four, and then gradually diminished after stage five. Uh, from, stage, uh, from stage five, uh, ECA collaterals usually started to form. Uh, Suzuki stage, though faithfully reflect the natural course of MMD, but uh, at clinical practice, we do find that in many cases, the changes in vasculature does not strictly follow these stages. For example, uh, in some patients with high Suzuki stage, we can still find some uh, quite abundant Moya Moya vessels. And the changes uh, in MCA and ACA might not be completely simultaneous as they are described in, the, in these stages. There are two age peaks for MMD manifestation. The first peak occurs in childhood with most cases diagnosed around the age of 10. Uh, the second peak occurs in adults uh, between the age of 30 and 50. Based on onset symptoms, uh, we can classify MMD patients as hemorrhagic type and ischemic type. Uh, in children and young adults, mm, uh, the ischemic type is the pro predominant type, uh, whereas in adults, hemorrhagic types became, became more prevalent. It is noticeable that as the patient's aging, the ratio of hemorrhagic type uh, gradually decreases. Uh, this is because uh, I think hemorrhagic strokes are more lethal than the ischemic ones. Even after proper treatment, many patients could still, uh, could still be killed by fatal recurrent bleeding in the long term. Because the pathophysiology of MMD was still, still not fully understood, the medical treatment uh, has not been very successful, uh, but it has become a consensus that surgical revascularization could effectively improve cerebral perfusion and reduces the incidences of recurrent strokes in patients compared to medical treatments. Uh, so current guidelines also suggest that surgical revascularization should be carried out for MMD patients uh, once they are diagnosed. A variety of surgical techniques has been adopted in the treatment of MMD based on whether ex uh, extracranial, intracranial anastomosis were conducted. These procedures can mainly be classified into two categories, which is direct bypass and indirect bypass. Currently, uh, direct bypass is the most commonly used procedure, uh, which often uses superficial temporal artery and middle cerebral artery anastomosis to reperfuse MCA territory. 
And in some special cases, we also use occipital artery to reperfuse PCA territory. Mm, indirect bypass is also another important surgical technique for MMD, uh, which only requires placing vascularized grafts onto the surface of the brain. So comparatively, comparatively this technique is much more simpler. Uh, this technique improves the cerebral perfusion by facilitating spontaneous collateral formations into brain parachema. The effect is slower comparing to uh, direct bypass. The most commonly used graft uh, in our center is STA or its branches. Uh, this procedure is referred to as EDAS. It is the first line in direct bypass surgery in our center. Mm. Uh, there is a, uh, it is important that in indirect bypass, the dura should be left open or inverted uh, to allow the ingrowth of vessels to the brain. The surgical area can be covered uh, then by seamless artificial dura meter to prevent leakage from cere uh, cerebr cerebral spinal fluid. Another com uh, other commonly used grafts include temporalis uh, or dura meter or periosteum. Uh, these are considered when STA was not available or when hypoperfusion territory is far from the course of STA. For example, uh, periosteum and durographs were often used to revascularize ACA territory. Uh, if both indirect and direct bypass are carried out at the same time, we call it combined bypass. Recently, combined bypass has become uh, the predominant procedure before direct bypass. In our center, we often use the anterior branch of STA to do the ECIC anastomosis and the posterior branch to do the indirect bypass. In a way, uh, the chances of patients to get good perfusion uh, in the long term might be doubled. Uh, in the past, uh, our patient selection uh, process is like for adult patients, uh, combined bypass surgery should be the first choice. If combined by bypass was not feasible, like in those patients who's only got one branch of STA uh, or, uh, uh, or some, some other circumstances, direct bypass should be carried out as a priority. Only when direct bypass was not feasible, uh, usually because the donor vessel is too thin or uh, a suitable recipient vessel cannot be found, Indirect bypass was then given as an alternative uh, treatment. In a word, the direct bypass was given the highest level of attention. A successful uh, ECIC anastomosis was considered a successful treatment. On the other hand, indirect bypass surgery was regarded as an inferior procedure with less effective revascularization. Uh, so they are mainly used in pediatric patients or as substitute procedure. Uh, however, over the years, uh, quite a few studies has reported a similar long-term outcome between patients who underwent different surgical strategies. Uh, published data from our own center, Beijing Tiantan Hospital, uh, compared uh, the outcome of patients who were given indirect bypass surgery and direct bypass surgery. This study was published in uh, 2016 uh, uh, in Journal of Neurosurgery. We included uh, 620 hemispheres that went through surgical, surgical treatment. Our results show that in the follow-up about two to five years, patients uh, who go through different treatment strategies have similar neurological, defic uh, neurological status, which are evaluated by a modified ranking scale and they also have similar incidences of recurrent strokes. Although the Kaplan-Meier analysis uh, shown here uh, can uh, show that patients who received a direct bypass do have a longer stroke-free survival time. A later study also from DAR Center uh, used the propensity score matching system to eliminate the heterogeneity between patients who were given different surgical modalities. Uh, this study yielded the same result that a uh, similar long-term outcome was achieved by different surgeries. 
So far, uh, other studies conducted by different study groups investigating the long-term outcome uh, in patients who are given different surgical treatments has yielded inc inconsistent results. Here we listed a few other studies supporting similar outcome between direct bypass and between direct and indirect bypass. But there are also other studies supporting that direct and combined bypass is still a superior than indirect bypass surgery. Mm, based on this increasing evidence, uh, indir indirect bypass has become more and more valued in the treatment of MMD in our center. Uh, but uh, which surgery is the best treatment uh, is, is still under debate. What we do know now is that pediatric patients often uh, benefit from indirect bypass surgery. And, direct by, and indirect bypass surgery is inferior in reducing recurrent uh, hemorrhagic, uh, hemorrhagic strokes, uh, as it is pointed out by Gemtrail in Japan. Uh, it is important to know that uh, it's still not very practical to conduct a strict uh, randomized control trial in MMD patients, based, because based on uh, the real world experience we are gaining through the years, we learned that there might not be a best treatment for all patients. However, there are pitfalls that we must consider carefully uh, to avoid during the decision-making process. Uh, apart from the long-term outcome, what happens in the perioperative period is also decisive for MMD patients because the brutal truth is that uh, surgical revascularization is not always safe. Uh, Post-operative complications could happen and sometimes they can be catastrophic. The most dangerous post-operative complication uh, we believe is ischemic strokes. Uh, sometimes they could leave a severe sequela for life uh, like hemiparalysis, and in some cases, they can even be fatal. Mm, so efforts must be made to prevent these ischemic complications, because no matter how successful the revascularization is, it can hardly, hardly be called satisfying if the patients have deficits uh, after treatment. Therefore, uh, the chances for post-operative complications after surgery were given carefully evaluation while we are planning surgeries for Moya Moya disease. Uh, an earlier study in 2018 from our center reported the overall incidences uh, of post-operative complications was around 12%. Uh, there is no significant differences between, uh, between the surgical modalities. The instance for ischemic strokes for indirect bypass surgery uh, was 5.5% uh, and for direct bypass surgery is 4.1%. Uh, for combined bypass surgery uh, was 5.8%. Uh, Still, there is no statistically difference. A more recent studies uh, conducted by a variety of study groups, including ours, yielded similar uh, complication rates among different surgical, uh, different surgeries. So basically, uh, in the real world studies, different surgeries had similar risks of post-operative ischemia. Uh, however, it is very important to notice that, uh, especially in our center, we do have a tendency to perform indirect bypass surgery on those patients who are under uh, higher risks for post-operative ischemia. So uh, there, is a, there might be a confounding bias that cannot be avoided in these studies. Though it has not been proven by data yet, uh, our first-hand experience did show that uh, the patients who are given indirect bypass surgery uh, were under smaller risks for catastrophic post-operative ischemic uh, attacks. The potential low risk, uh, we believe, is probably related to the shorter time of the procedure lasted. Uh, our data show the operation time for indirect bypass surgery is 160 minutes uh, in average. And for direct bypass surgery, this number was 210 minutes. The duration is short, so the maintaining of blood pressure during anesthesia should be easier. Uh, on the other hand, after indirect bypass surgery, the cerebral blood flow goes through a gradual increase uh, instead of a drastic change. So ischemia caused by the unstable hemodynamics 
is less likely to happen. Uh, there's no need to worry about hyperperfusion syndrome, which is only and often seen after, indir- after direct bypass. So supposedly the post-operative management uh, about blood pressure control uh, is uh, it's less of a paradox after indirect bypass surgery. Uh, having learned all this information uh, about MMD treatment uh, in real world practices, the flow of decision-making process is gradually changing these years. The notion that direct bypass always come first uh, has been renewed in our center. It is very important to bring individualized evaluation into MMD treatment. Uh, Basically, what we consider first is to avoid perioperative risk. Mm, The second uh, is to maximize the perfusion improvement. We believe the careful balance between these two objectives is the key to the successful treatment of Moya Moya disease. Uh, For patients with low risks, uh, we turn to uh, aggressive treatments can be given. Uh, Direct bypass or combined bypass bypass surgery could be considered. And for those those patients who are with high risk, uh, indirect bypass is recommended first in order to avoid fatal ischemia after surgery. So identifying patients who who were uh, under high risk is very important at clinical practice. Uh, Our uh, previous large sample size study uh, has given us some risk factors of this uh, post-operative ischemia. Mm. Having uh, pre-operative ischemic events uh, is an important risk factor. Uh, If the patient had recent strokes, the surgery should probably be postponed uh, also, in those with frequent TIA attacks before surgery, strict blood control should be taken uh, to ensure safety during the perioperative period. PCA involvement is another well-recognized risk factor. Uh, in ordinary patients who only showed ICA involvement, PCA might provide compensate uh, for the anterior part of the brain by forming pyocollaterals. But for patients with both PCA and ICA stenosis, uh, cerebral perfusion is significantly impaired. Uh, Careful management must be taken to avoid surgery-induced complications. Uh, 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 Professor Duan from the Faith Medical Center of uh, Chinese Pilale Hospital has proposed a very useful grading system to evaluate collateral formations, uh, collateral formations in MMD patients, namely MMD collateral grading system. This system evaluates compensating collaterals formed by PCA uh, to supplement perfusion loss by uh, caused by ICA stenosis, uh, as well as the status of ICA itself. In combining these two parameters. Uh, this system accurately reflects the overall ischemic extent of the whole brain. So patients with low, a low score has, severe, has more severe blood flow impairment and poorer collaterals. And these patients were under higher risks for post-operative ischemic strokes. And geographic outcome is very important in evaluating the real effect of the surgery. It is a direct reflection of perfusion improvement. From where we stand, we believe that the success of, uh, success of treatment lay in collateral formation uh, after revascularization surgery. Uh, the analysis of follow-up angiography provides precious information for renewing our experiences. However, uh, it is uh, it is not not uh, not easy to get because not all pa- patients are willing to go through another angiography unless they are preparing for the surgery. So we reviewed our data of patients and evaluate uh, the angiographic outcome with Matsushima standard. Uh, we found that uh, we uh, we found that uh, in indirect bypass surgery uh, about. Uh, 60% of patients achieved good outcome. Uh, in patients who were given direct or combined bypass surgery, uh, this number was about 75%. Uh, 
Uh, however, as we did not match for any confounders, so these rates uh, should not be compared directly. Uh, with all the advantages in avoiding post-operative ischemia and the simplicity of techniques, the main drawback for indirect bypass surgery, uh, which cannot be overlooked, is still the rather uncertain revascularization effect. The truth is that in some patients, cleft rows fail to grow after indirect bypass surgery and lead to unsatisfying effect. Comparatively, comparatively direct bypass surgery is more certain uh, although it is often ignored that in the long term, direct bypass might also get occluded. The guarantee of in instant improvement in blood flow right after surgery is sometimes taken as a guarantee for long-term revascularization in direct bypass surgery, which we think is not always the case. Therefore, to bring out the best effect of indirect bypass surgery, we believe it is very important to set up a rigorous standard to select patients who might get good re revascularization from indirect bypass surgery. Uh, to do this, uh, we analyzed uh, three, uh, two, 231 procedures, uh, uh, patients with uh, preoperative and follow-up angiography to compare, evaluating the spontaneous collateral formation after indirect bypass surgery. Our results show that uh, hemorrhagic type is an independent risk factor of good outcome. Uh, in fact, hemorrhagic type uh, of MND patients appear to have a terrible collateral formation after indirect bypass surgery. This finding uh, might account for the fact that indirect bypass is less efficient in reducing re-bleeding uh, in the long term. Surprisingly, uh, we found that age, uh, though it is often considered as an important predictor of successful indirect revascularization, uh, it is not an independent predictor. The relation is apparent though uh, that patients with good surgical outcomes are younger, but it is definitely not the only influential factor. So which means uh, factors other than age should also be taken into evaluation while deciding surgical strategies. We also found uh, Moyama vessels from the ICA terminus is another independent predictor too. That means patients who have abundant Moyama vessels turn to have better outcomes uh, after indirect bypass surgery. And the reason is unclear. Uh, we, postul we postulated that it could be related to the pro-angiogenesis microenvironment in Moya Moya disease that induces the, form, uh, the formation of Moya Moya vessels in the first place, but this has not been, has not been tested yet. Uh, although there is a tendency that patients in the, uh, with, early, uh, with early Suzuki stages get poor improvements, uh, Suzuki stages were not an independent predictor in this study. And here is a picture showing how we assess ICA Moya Moya vessels. Uh, figure A and B both showed uh, absent Moya Moya vessels. A, figure A are from a, a early stage Suzuki, early Suzuki stage patient and figure B are from a late uh, Suzuki stage patients. Uh, figure C shows fair Moya Moya vessels and figure D showed abundant Moya Moya vessels stretching into all directions. To understand uh, the predictors we found uh, better, we further conducted subgroup, subgroup analysis. Our study included uh, 45 cases of hemorrhagic type IMMD. Uh, only 10 of them had good revascularization. In these patients, we found that age is the only predictor of good angiogenesis. Uh, so generally speaking, for hemorrhagic type of patients, indirect bypass surgery should not be recommended unless these patients are very young, uh, they might stand a chance. 73% uh, of non-hemorrhagic type uh, MMD patients get good revascularization after indirect bypass surgery. We found for these patients, ICA Moya Moya vessels is the only predictor for good collateral formation, 
while age is no longer an independent predictor. This finding uh, has changed our previous notion that elder patients should not be given indirect bypass surgery. These days, we've started to try out uh, indirect bypass in some non-hemorrhagic uh, and older patients, especially for those who are under high risk for postoperative complications. Uh, so far, we found that uh, some patients did show pretty satisfying outcome, even with older age. Uh, our previous indication for indirect bypass is more like for those who cannot undergo in who cannot undergo direct bypass surgery, indirect bypass can serve as an alternative procedure. Uh, with gradual increased experience, now we are trying to amplify the scope of indirect bypass. Mm, to further improve the patient selection, we develop a normal gram uh, for screening patients for indirect bypass surgery. We enlarged our cohort to 263 hemispheres these patients are also enrolled from a multi-center cohort. Uh, to reduce bias, we only included those who underwent EDA surgery. After a preliminary, preliminary analysis uh, for independent predictors, we included four potential predictors uh, in this model, which are age, uh, onsite type, uh, Suzuki stage, and Moya Moya vessels. By adding up points, we can accurately predict the effect of indirect bypass. The higher uh, the points a patient can get, the higher prob probability there is to get a better outcome. We also test the performance of our model. Uh, the C index for, for this nomogram was 0.8. Uh, we believe this nomogram could be a great tool for choosing candidates for indirect bypass surgery. For patients who get low score uh, in this nomogram, uh, direct or combined bypass surgery should be recommended first. To sum up, uh, predictors for collateral formation after indirect bypass surgery included younger age, uh, hemorrhagic onset, MMV, and Suzuki stages later than stage three. For those patients with low probability to get good, uh, good perfusion, Direct bypass or combined bypass should be considered first. And for those who with high probability, uh, indirect bypass should be recommended. Here we show a possible flowchart of the patient selection strategy in our center. First is to evaluate post-operative ischemic risk, as we have emphasized many times. Uh, for those patients who are under high risk, indirect bypass should be considered first. Uh, and for those who uh, are under moderate risks, uh, more, aggressive, uh, more aggressive strategies can be taken. Uh, for, hemorrh for hemorrhagic type patients, combined bypass should be considered the preferential treatment. And if this is not feasible, efforts must be, must be made to guarantee a patent direct bypass in order to prevent bleeding in the long term. For non-hemorrhagic patients, uh, if they have uh, abundant moyamoya vessels, indirect bypass can be considered uh, before direct or combined bypass. And age uh, should, not, uh, should also be evaluated, but uh, age should no longer be an exclu uh, exclusion criteria for indirect bypass surgery. We believe it is crucial to consider as many factors as possible while deciding surgical strategies for Moya Moya patients. Only in this way, we have the best chance to accomplish a successful treatment for Moya Moya patients. Uh, okay, that'll be all for my presentation today. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank the organizer of ACNS for this great, great opportunity for me to share our experience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow, for your uh, presentation. Shall I invite the chair, uh, Professor Xu Bin, to come in on the second uh, lectures? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chow, and the uh, very impressive and informative presentation. And uh, she introduced uh, their uh, own center's experience in treatment of the Moya Moya disease. Thank you again. 
But I think the Moyama disease and the Moyama vascular epilepsy is the most complicated uh, uh, disease type in the neurovascular uh, diseases. And uh, I think that every neurosurgeon has their own habit and uh, favorite surgical um, modalities. And it is difficult to form a unified, uh, unified opinion, but the individualized treatment uh, is still consensus. So uh, actually, I couldn't agree all of your opinion, but uh, <laughs> still thank you very much. So uh, there is a question in the chat box about the uh, 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 from uh, Ayman Ali uh, Mayers. So the question is, is it advised to go for anastomosis with patient with uh, sickle cell anemia and with uh, multiple uh, ischemic shock and the uh, and closure of the right eye say? I think the main point is about the sickle cell anemia with the multiple ischemic events. So would you consider a, a direct uh, bypass or indirect bypass in this case? Mm. Uh, actually, I think uh, uh, with uh, these patients with sickle cell and uh, anemia, uh, we still believe the procedure should be uh, uh, should be evaluated uh, with uh, like uh, with as more factors as possible. Uh, I, th I still think the most important is to uh, is to evaluate the post operative risks because uh, like uh, it is. Uh, Ever, it is like uh, Dr. Xu has suggested that every patient, every MD patient is different uh, with higher risks, like uh, with patients with higher risks, uh, probably the indirect bypass surgery should be recommended uh, in order to avoid the post-operative ischemia. Uh, and uh, for those patients who uh, are under moderate risk, risks, uh, direct or combined bypass should be considered. I think uh, the, what is important is to uh, evaluate uh, the angiography. Yeah, yes, uh, uh, Professor. Yes, I uh, think uh, it is uh, recommended to do the bypass if the, if it's possible, uh, if it's uh, uh, you have the technique. Uh, I have some uh, similar case uh, from Italy neurosurgeon's consultant, and uh, I recommended the uh, bypass, and uh, the surgical result is quite good. Thank you. It's not very uh, common in Chinese uh, patient. Yes. Thank you. I can see uh, Professor Robert uh, Boros uh, raise up his hand. Yes, thank you for giving me the floor. I would like to congratulate uh, our lecturer for her very clear and didactic presentation. And I must say that I am a little bit jealous by the beauty of her hospital. Very nice, big first <laughs> slide, beautiful <laughs> hospital. I'm really attracted by architecture. And I must say it's for me, one of the most beautiful hospital I have so far seen. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you visited the hospital? <laughs> it's just like an airplane. It's, <laughs> it's just an airport. <laughs> it's wonderful. Very big. Yes. Uh, I have a question based on your experience. In my department, we have only 25 cases of Moya Moya disease and who have been treated by uh, indirect bypass with excellent results so far. I have seen which you huge experience of 500, more than 500 cases uh, for the lecturer. And I know that Bill is one of the best surgeons regarding direct bypass. I would like to ask a question. What is for you, both of you the question, what is for you the patient with the Moya Moya disease for whom you would recommend absolutely to perform a direct bypass? Uh, I think uh, uh, the patient that would uh, definitely recommend direct bypass is the patient with history of, uh, hemorrhag uh, of hemorrhagic strokes. These patients, uh, you have to perform direct, bi direct bypass to reduce the instances of re-bleeding re in the future. Uh, this has been, uh, there has been a lot of published studies 
uh, addressing this uh, this issue. And for other patients, uh, we think that for adult patients, direct bypass and combined bypass should be recommended first uh, if we uh, think that they are not going to uh, they are less likely going to have post-operative ischemia. Uh, and for pediatric patients, we think it, uh, like indirect bypass uh, is more suitable. Okay, That's in my answer. team, with a very small experience, 25 cases, we do not have one case of hemorrhagic. In your mm -hmm. series of 500, with, what are the percentage of hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhagic cases? Mm. What is the percentage of patients with hemorrhage? Uh, Patients with cerebral hemorrhage, uh, uh, you mean? Uh, I think uh, in uh, uh, in adults, uh, the ratio is rather low. But in uh, uh, no, no, sorry, uh, in pediatric patients, uh, hemorrhagic type is rather low. But in adult patients, uh, approximately uh, forty percent to fifty percent of adult patients have had histories of cerebral hemorrhages. Uh, this is the uh, this is to uh, come from the epidemiology study in East Asia, uh, especially in our country. Thank you. Yes, and B, the, the same opinion? ratio. Yes, uh, in the pediatric patient, it's around ten percent uh, hemorrhagic, and uh, the adult patient is a uh, uh, forty-five percent around this yes. percentage, and. Uh, uh, Dr. Charles' uh, reply is quite good. And uh, for my criteria to do the uh, direct bypass, normally if the pediatric patient is younger than uh, six years old and the, and the patient have some TIA attack, uh, so I will do the direct bypass. So my youngest uh, patient for the direct bypass is four years old. And uh, normally, uh, the patient uh, uh, takes a uh, uh, wide EDMS is the, the best choice. I think the EDAS is too narrow. The, the expansion of the cortex is uh, too narrow. And I prefer to use a, a wide uh, EDMS uh, treatment and it can cover most of the cortex right. and the uh, it's only need two times, both both in, uh, in uh, one lateral, we can treat one, uh, one this incision and there is another one, you can uh, cover all the brain and uh, the frontal, the occipital and the uh, temporal parietal, every, every uh, lobe. And uh, I think this is uh, my treatment. And uh, for, uh, if the patient is stable, the symptoms is uh, quite stable, the EDMS is enough for the pediatric patient. And uh, in my personal series, uh, I have around uh, 100 patients of this kind of young children, uh, young children in uh, pediatric uh, hospital every year around 100 patients and uh, all use this EDMS. Maybe ten of them I will prefer. Uh, I will do the direct bypass because of the symptoms attack. For the uh, adult patient, uh, around the ninety uh, percent, I will pr perform the direct bypass combined EDMS. So it's a combination treatment. And uh, uh, sometimes, if the patient's cortex, the uh, recipient vessel is too small, and I will do the uh, EDMS. And uh, if the uh, sometimes the donor, the ratio of the, of the donor artery and the recipient artery, if it's larger than two point five, I will abandon the, the direct bypass because the donor artery carry on too much br uh, blood volume uh, to the, comparing to the recipient artery. Yeah, that's my criteria. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, Chow, can I ask a question? And uh, 
so first of all, uh, congratulations to uh, the, the, the result of your uh, unit. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. So my first question is about, you mentioned that about one of the um, uh, indicator for poor outcome would be the, uh, the pre-operative uh, ischemic event. So usually how long would you wait for the last ischemic event uh, to, the, uh, to the time of the bypass? The second question is about, uh, you mentioned about some of the ischemic complications around five, uh, four to five percent. So can you share some tips uh, of your unit, uh, how to reduce uh, the, the the ischemic events? For example, the what is the perioperative antipater regime in your unit? And also uh, any other techniques, for example, using the burst of passion or other uh, other techniques. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, the first question is how long we will wait uh, uh, after the after a recent ischemic stroke uh, to until the surgery, right? Uh, I think uh, in our center, if the patient uh, had a uh, had a stroke showing on uh, MRI, uh, especially a high signal of uh, on DWI, we will probably uh, postpone the surgeries for uh, around uh, three, three months uh, to, uh, to uh, waiting for the patient to get a more uh, stable hemodynamic status. And to reduce post-operative is, uh, ischemia, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, Mm, uh, there are a lot of uh, efforts should make, be made. First, uh, the, uh, the anesthesia during surgery is very important. You have to maintain a strict blood, uh, blood pressure control during the anesthesia, um, uh, or otherwise we'll probably will find the patient uh, having, uh, having uh, ischemic complications right after surgery. Uh, and when they were back to, uh, back to ward, uh, fluid therapy uh, should be given uh, aggressive, uh, kind of aggressively, and the blood control should also be maintained uh, at a rather high level. This is our uh, our methods to prevent ischemic attacks after surgery. Yes, uh, my uh, in my center we will wait uh, six weeks after the stroke, and uh, before the surgical mm -hmm. treatment, we mm -hmm. will give the patient uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy before the surgical treatment. And uh, if the uh, you mentioned the uh, after surgi uh, surgical uh, ischemic attack, we will also give the patient uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy as soon as possible. So the hyperbaric oxygen is available in the Huasan Hospital? Yeah, it's uh, quite uh, popular in almost in every hospital <laughs> here. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> So okay, is... the another patient is uh, what's the be best approach to those patients with both Moya Moya disease and the symptomatic aneurysm? Uh, I, think the for, mm -hmm. uh, I think for this patient, uh, it is important uh, to decide whether the, the aneurysms are uh, hemodynamic aneurysms, aneurysms uh, that lies in Moya Moya, ves uh, Moya, Moya vessels or are they real? Uh, aneurysms uh, locating on ICA or uh, PCA. And you know, for the first one, uh, we just uh, we just perform uh, direct or combined bypass surgery. Uh, and if the revascularization is good enough, uh, the hemodynamic aneurysms might disappear, disappear themselves. Uh, uh, on the other hand, for those real uh, aneurysms, uh, so, uh, some of them will have to be treated uh, by endovascular uh, endovascular treatments. Yes, I agree with Dr. Chow. And uh, uh, he, she mentioned that the hemodynamic uh, aneurysms, actually this kind of aneurysm is uh, peripheral uh, pseudo aneurysms. And uh, in the uh, DSA, you couldn't see the uh, very clear, the, pseudo, uh, the feeders of the aneurysm. So yes. this kind of uh, aneurysm, after the uh, revascularization, normally they can shrink and uh, cured by themselves. And uh, if you can find some uh, uh, direct uh, feeder arteries, uh, you can uh, thrombose it, use uh, marathon microcatheter and uh, use uh, very small 
uh, coils just uh, embolized the feeder. If it's uh, uh, aneurysms located on the Willis circle, you can clip it directly. Mm. Use the same approach. Uh, another question is, is it okay to do side-by-side -side bypass? I don't think it's necessary because the side-by-side -side, uh, bypass normally used in the treatment in the complicated aneurysms uh, in like uh, M2, M2 side-by-side or A2, A2 side-by-side -side bypasses. So in the uh, treatment of Moyama disease, the anto side is enough and the side side is unnecessary. Dr. Chao, what's your opinion? Uh, I agree with Dr. Xu. Uh, I think it, it, it is okay to do side by side bypass, but it is uh, probably not necessary, uh, especially like in most patients, they have two uh, branches of uh, the STA. Uh, one should, uh, one can be used to uh, perform the uh, into side bypass, and then another another one is still sufficient to do the indirect bypass. So it's not really necessary to do the side by side, and we haven't tried this technique in our center yet. So uh, if there is uh, f uh, no further questions, then uh, it will come to the end of uh, this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, it's, today is a very exciting uh, discussion. Uh, uh, webinars and also the discussion and uh, we all learn so much from it. So uh, on behalf of the educational committee of the ACNS and the president, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Yoshihiro Muragaki and also uh, uh, Dr. Yahoo Chow, as well as the chairs, Professor uh, Christian Murphy-Polos and Professor for a time and the support of the ACNS webinars. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Xu Bin for broadcasting the webinar on the WeChat channel and today. Um, and, and also a special uh, thanks uh, to uh, Roger and also uh, Dolio uh, for joining me today. So uh, until we meet uh, online on the, uh, on the, on the 27th of May, it's a bye-bye uh, from all of us. And I would like to thank you, all of you, for joining uh, today's webinar. And uh, thank you so much.